Well, good morning, everyone. All right. Before we get going today, wanted to uh, one thank. I don't know if Jordan is here, but if you see Jordan, he's the one that led worship today. Make sure that you welcome him. Uh, he's been out all week with us, and so uh, had some great interviews. He had an opportunity to meet the worship team and spend some time uh, with them. So make sure you guys welcome him and tell tell him uh, great for coming on out and hanging out with us and leading us in worship. Amen. All right. <laughs> And if you're, uh, if, you're, if you're grumpy and you have not a good personality, just tell him you came for the free donuts and that you don't normally attend, okay? And then he'll feel better about that, all right? So uh, anyway, it's, uh, he'll be flying back uh, home tomorrow. And so do pray for our possibly transition and all that kind of stuff. Are you all with me? Amen. All right. So uh, hopefully you got an outline coming in. Uh, today we'll start a brand new series on Wounded. And uh, we're going to talk about this over the next uh, five weeks, this being uh, week number one. And so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about wounded by words that we have uh, in, in our life and kind of the struggles that we have, all right? But I think oftentimes when we have the word wounded or wounds, we think of scars and stuff, right? And so um, I showed the first two services uh, my knees and I got a standing ovation and they're throwing dollar bills at me. So I won't do it because I have like, I got like $10,000 today. So, but the reason why I'm not a supermodel or a model of legs is because I have two scars on my knees, all right? And so you want to see them? All right, no. All right, so one of them is on this knee, and it's, it's, it's uh, you know, going up and down my leg, and I was uh, probably like in third grade, so what are you in third grade, like 19 or 20? ish, all right? So uh, anyhow, I was playing hide-and-go-seek. My buddies, you know, were hiding or whatever, and I seen the base, however that game went. I crawled out from underneath the bush. Someone had broken a bottle and sliced my leg. Wound number one, all right? Actually, that was wound number two. Then when I was younger, maybe like five or six-ish years old, I was playing in the bathtub, and I had a glass cup. Now, I know what you're thinking, Whose mother does he belong to? Well, what my mom said is the hairdryer wouldn't plug into the wall and reach the bathtub. So she gave, I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, really? Yeah, she's like, here, oh, darn, we need to get an extension cord. No. So anyhow, I, we have no idea. In fact, my mom's passed away now. But for years, it was like, how did I get a glass cup? She goes, I have no idea. So anyway, I'm playing with it, slice. All right. So again, that's why I'm not a supermodel. I'm a pastor instead. Sorry. All right. So, but when we think about wounds, that's what we typically think about. Someone had surgery, someone had a car accident, some type of accident, and there's some type of, you know, physical thing that you see. But what we don't re realize and recognize is how many wounds we have inside of us. Right? And, and that is really kind of the hard part of processing wounds that we have in our life. In fact, you, if you went to school back in the day, with sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you or words will never hurt you. And that isn't true. Actually, I, you're healed. I'll, I won't be a supermodel, but I, I'm healed. Right? But the wounds that people say to us in words, sometimes they never heal in our life. Right? And we've, we've heard the phrase, you know, so-and-so has a lot of baggage. And, and, and what's funny about that is <clears throat> it's like they have it, whew, we don't have any. Right? Like we are good, good, good. I am a catch. <laughs> right? But the truth is we all have baggage. And we have baggage from people, from words, Words that we say to ourselves, words that others say, experiences. And so we have all this stuff that gets packed into our life. And as we walk through life, those types of experiences reveal themselves ultimately in behavior. And I'll get into it in a minute because your belief ultimately reveals itself in action. And so if you believe that you're a loser because someone else has said it or because you believe that in, in your own mind, then you typically have actions that support that thought, right? If you feel like you're a victim, if you feel like you're underachiever, if you feel like all that stuff, it's because you have a belief and ultimately 
It drives itself in a way of an action, all right? So here's the thing about church, and I, you'll hear me talk about this from time to time because I want to break the myth. The myth is when we walk in, most of you showered like Tuesday of last week, right? You have kind of some deodorant going on. You look pretty nice. All right, some of you look better than others, okay? And so you look around the room and you make assessments, right? You're, the assessment is always this. They have it all together, right? And then you internally are struggling with stuff, and you feel like you're the odd person out, right? Man, I wish I had it like everyone else in the church. I'm the odd person out, okay? So let me share with you, this is years and years ago, but it's still true today, all right? So years ago when I was transitioning from youth ministry into senior ministry, this church had like 30 pe or, uh, 80 people at that time, and I had meetings with people, and they would come and they would talk about personal issues, and, and I had kind of a gift in, in uh, counseling and an interest. I had some schooling in it, and so I, I it kind of gravitated to it, and I'd have another person come and another person come and another person come and another person come, and then it dawned on me, even though we had like 80 people on a Sunday, I realized that there was a common thread that there were a lot of people who had the nerve to call me, which simply meant there was a lot of other people who were struggling with the same stuff. Well, back in the day, you didn't preach about stuff like that. That was not the way that we were taught. And so I ran into a guy named Dale Galloway up in Oregon, and his whole ministry was misfits. And he actually had I mean, he had a mega church. Four mega churches were mega churches. I mean, he had a giant church. And it was all addicts and alcoholics and prostitutes. I mean, it was like the fringe of the people, right? All of his messages was geared that way. And I began to get his cassette tapes, remember those days? And digest what that guy was doing because it was so different than what we were trained to do in school. And I began to see how he would talk about problems through scripture to give his people the help and hope that he needed, right? So fast forward a little bit further, I ran into a person who ran a Christian biblical counseling. So there's Christians who are counselors, and then there's biblical counseling, which is a whole separate type of, of counseling. And so they ran a group, they had maybe like 1,200 students, so when you graduated with your master's degree, before you got your, your degree to go out and practice, you had to do, I think, 1,200 or, or 3,000 hours of clinical time. So I had a conversation with the person on the phone, right? I was just, we were just chatting, and I'm like, how many students? I got 1,200 students. I got 1,200 students. I said, that's huge. That's ginormous. And it was a similar area population like we have. And I said, is that like overkill? And he chuckled. And he goes, actually, we could have 2,400 students who are graduating, and there still would be a demand. And I'm like, really? Now, this is church people. Only about 1% or 2% of folks were coming outside of the church because it was all Bible-based, right? It wasn't secular counseling. It was all Bible-based. And I said, in, those, in that area, you have that kind of demand. And he said, some of our ones who are practicing in our area have a three-year waiting list to be seen. He said, Dan, some of them no longer take clients. They're, they're just booked. And I'm like, wow. So then I had another couple experiences with counselors. And actually, there's one that I know in the area and um, she has not taken a new client in over three years. And so if you don't have kind of an in in her, in her practice, she won't see you. She's that busy in our area. So what does that tell you? The whole myth that believers have everything together is absolutely not true. It absolutely isn't true. And so when you sit and you struggle and you look around and everyone has a nice outfit on and they you know, look good and smell good and all that kind of stuff and you're instantly thinking, well, they got everything together. Folks, that's not it. The majority of us have struggles in our life. In fact, today we'll talk a little bit about self-esteem. If you can argue with me, because in premarital class I have it where we talk about self-esteem and almost all of them go, no, I don't have a struggle. Give me five minutes and I will reveal to you your insecurity because every one of us have insecurities in our life. 
Every one of us do. And our beliefs affect our actions in our life, right? They, they reveal themselves in our actions. So at the very top of your outline, it says, what is self-esteem? This is the de de definition, and I'm going to change it here in a moment. So self-esteem reflects a person's overall subjective emotional evaluation of his or her own worth. So in other words, every person looks at themselves, and they make a judgment call. All right. By the way, side note, first service, right? Talk about weird, right? God's planning. Some guy came in, his brother was in town, and so we were chit-chatting, and I said, oh, what, what, is, what do you do? He was a clinical psychologist in, in a hospital, so it's a secular one. And I said, so was I right or wrong? He goes, actually, he's in San Diego. He said, in our area, it's the same year, same thing, three-year waiting list in the secular world. Right? So, I mean, this is, this is amazing. And children, moms and dads, children are worse, and I don't mean worse like worse than their parents, but have more mental health issues than their parents do. Adolescents and teenagers. All right? So this is a, this is a big deal. All right? So we make judgment calls on ourselves. It, uh, it is a judgment of oneself as well as an attitude toward self. Thoughts, feelings, actions. So how you think is how you feel is ultimately your actions in your life. Okay? You with me? So possessing um, a little self-regard can lead people to become depressed, to, to, fall into, uh, to, uh, to fall short of their potential, or to tolerate abusive situations and relationships. And then here's where we're going to go over the next several weeks. Understanding your value to Christ is how you heal your wounds. Understanding your value to Christ is how you heal the wounds that all of us pick up in life. And the baggage that we carry around, all that is, is healed through Christ in our life. Amen? So let's talk a little bit about two of the common areas today in today's message, all right? So two of the common areas that we end up getting wounds from is, number one in your outline, words that others say to us, okay? Words that others say to us. You hear on the news, guns, knives, weapons, right? All this other stuff. No one talks about words, and the truth is, right, the truth is the physical wounds will heal. The emotional he uh, wounds will not heal or it becomes very complicated for that to take place. And so look with me what Proverbs uh, twelve eighteen says. Reckless words pierce like a what? It's a weapon, right? And then it goes on and it says, but the tongue of the wise brings healing in our life. And then, and then James says in the New Testament, James says the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It, it, uh, it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and we'll stop there in the comma, right? So here's the translation, that a person who doesn't have control of their tongue, they end up just destroying, and the analogy is a fire, and we're, you know, California, we've seen fires in, in our foothills and stuff, and it is devastating. It burns everything to the ground, and he says words are like that, right? They absolutely destroy uh, uh, our lives, and then what makes it more complicated is the words that people say who love us, and they speak into our hearts, right? And this is what makes it so difficult to untangle the wounds from words. Because if the guy at the grocery store calls you an idiot and a jerk and whatever, you look at them and kind of go, dude, you need to go take a nap, <laughs> right? And you leave. Maybe you tell someone about it. Maybe you don't. Maybe they have a Laurel Ridge sticker on the back of their car. Maybe they don't right? But, but you leave. It, you don't pay any attention, but someone comes into your life that loves you, and they speak harsh words into your life. It complicates things, doesn't it? And isn't it true that we say the most hurtful things to the people that we love the most, right? And so, so he says that it destroys the lives around us and 
you know, oftentimes people who have a tongue that isn't guarded will end up destroying the relationships and then they wonder why no one wants to hang out with them. And it's kind of like, go look at your mouth, man. I mean, that kind of, that's kind of the beginning of it to understand. And it goes on and it says, it sells itself on fire by hell. Uh, it is a restless evil but, uh, full of deadly poison. All right? And then it goes on in verse 9 and it says, with the tongue, we praise the Lord and Father, comma, stop. Did you sing? Did you say amen? Did you say, oh, God is faithful? Right? And with that same mouth, you attack someone else. And then James makes it worse. And with it, you curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. In other words, you're actually cursing God. All right? How you feel now? And so it becomes really important that we begin to recognize the importance of the words that, that, that we speak in our life. And so the whole, or that, that we speak into the lives of others and that others speak into the lives of us, us. And if you have, and we'll talk about it when we get to people, if you have people in your life that is actually destroying your life with words, there's got to be boundaries. You cannot just continue to sit there in the firing squad and, and take it. There has to be a boundary where you're able to find protection. And we'll talk about that in, in, a, in a couple weeks. So the whole thing, sticks and stones will break our bones, not true. All right, the next one, number two. The second area that's common where we end up getting wounds is the words we say to ourselves. All right, words that we say to ourselves. We believe the lies from other people. It comes into our life, and it begins to go around and round and round, which made me think of this, and I actually wrote it down. I actually got on that cell. Sad I am. I need a life. Um, you remember uh, the Ronco back in the day? Those of you who are a little bit older, you remember the pocket fisherman, right? And he did infomercials back before infomercials were, you know, they didn't have shopping channels and all that kind of stuff. Some of you remember? Just shake your head to make me feel good, otherwise I'm going to have to go to counseling, okay? So, so Ron Popeil was his name, and they went, actually, they, they, I think they did chapter 13 or chapter 11, they went bankrupt, he sold off the stuff. And so, but, but he had a cooking unit, all right? It was a rotisserie cooker, all right? Now, this is going to be freeing. You're going to feel close to the Lord. I want you to be honest. Did you buy one of those rotisserie chicken roasters? Raise your hand if you did. All right. Now, what, this is what's funny. This is what's funny. They sold about as many of those as the George Foreman cookers, hamburger cookers. So let me ask this. How many of you bought a George Foreman cooker? Go ahead and raise your hand. Exactly. So you know what that tells me? There's a lot of people in this house that's not honest. All right? Because the numbers should be about the same. So anyhow, we'll keep going. I'll act like you guys are right and it's not liar, liar, pants on fire. Okay? So anyhow, we, we, with this chicken thing and you'd skew it, you'd put it in the, in the roaster. And then he had a slogan with that cooker. Anybody remember it? What, what, what was it? Set it and forget it. Now, isn't it funny? Three people raised their hand. Nine people knew the slogan. <laughs> what does that tell you? Okay, just, just call in the office. Okay. So you set it and you forget it. All right? Now, don't you wish life was that like that? That you could have words thrown at you that actually, absolutely filleted you and you could forget it? We're more like the chicken in the roaster, <laughs> spinning around and around and around and around and around, and those thoughts just keep going around and around and around and around in our life, right? And, and then we begin to ultimately believe it. And what, what's interesting is the evil one, which I said last week, hates you, so you are hated by someone, Satan, but he loves for you to do that because you destroy yourself and he doesn't need to do anything for you. Self-destruction right, in our life. Now, you think about folks in the Bible, and this is the one that's always amazing to me. You know who had this problem was Moses. And Moses, I think, is like in the top three great leaders. Not, not Jesus. I'm not including him in there because he's both God and, and, and in the flesh. But, you know, the leaders, Paul, Moses, you know, different ones. I think, I think Moses is in the top three, right? And so Moses is 80 years old. 
And God comes to Moses, and you, you probably know the story. God comes to Moses and says, Moses, I want you to lead my people out of captivity, 400 years of slavery, right? And, and you remember what Moses did? Moses fell on the ground and said, God, you are the creator of all things. You are amazing. You're so faithful, like all the songs that we just sang. You are so faithful and so amazing. Absolutely, God, I'm going to go to Pharaoh, and we're going to storm the gates of hell with a squirt gun before they made squirt guns, Right? No, not even close. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent. I am slow of speech and tongue. Historians believe that he had a stuttering issue. Now, people are people just like they are today. Someone has some type of an issue, their people are going to cap on them. So he has school kids, he has his parents, perhaps, people in the community or whatever. And so Moses believed that he was inferior in some way. And so God does something, and verse 11 and following is the answer to the wounds in your life. So the Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Now, that is not a question that anybody's going to wrestle with. God did. And then God says to him, is it not I, the Lord? And so what God does to Moses is exactly what he wants us to do. He is turning Moses' mind away from whatever struggles that he has about a speech issue. And he's turning him and he says, Moses, you are looking at the wrong thing. You need to look to me who created your mouth and who ultimately is going to give you the words to speak, right? And so he changes his focus, we think, until you read the next part of the verse. So verse 11, now go, I will help you. And look at, look at all the parts that he, God's involved in Moses' conversation. I will help you speak. I will teach you what to say, right? And we'll, we'll stop there at verse 13. And again, Moses falls on the ground and says, God, you are so faithful. Forgive me for that. Absolutely. Point me in the direction of Pharaoh. I'm going right now to Pharaoh. We're going to do this. You're going to set your people free. So Moses says to, to the Lord, oh, Lord, please send someone else to do it. Right? Now, just pause for a moment because we know the story. We know that Moses is going to go, and we know that Pharaoh is going to release him, and we know there's going to be the parting of the sea and the Ten Commandments and all this other stuff, right? We know that part. But let's just be honest for, for half a second here. How many times has God got your attention and said, look at me, and you said, but God, send someone else, do something else? right? Because whatever it is, you're believing something that isn't true. And Moses believed that he couldn't. My mom used to say when I was a kid, I can't and I can are both right. And I say, I can't, she'd say, you're right. When I say, I can, she'd say, you're right. You know, I think there's great wisdom in that. New Testament, Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. It says, the eyes, uh, your eyes are a window into your body, right? And another translation says, the eyes are a porthole into your soul. And there's two kind of meanings on this, on this passage. One is that what we look at in the world, it gets etched in our brain. So what you see, you can't unsee, right? Which is a great lesson of being careful of what you're allowing your eyes to be exposed to. And this is true, really, truly, uh, uh, really true with men because men are visual learners. And so you have to be extremely careful of what you allow your eyes to see because it gets etched in your mind. But there's also another uh, meaning in this, and that is that you, when you look at the world through the sight of God, it changes the perspective of the world, Okay. And so he says in verse uh, uh, 22, he says, your eyes are a window into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder, and you can underline that, and belief, and you can underline that, your body fills up with light. 
In other words, when you look at the world through God's perspective and you see God as the creator and the sustainer that spoke the world into existence, that's faithful, and you have belief that he infinitely loves you, that he'll never fail you, if you believe that, your perspective of life is going to be different, right? And then the verse goes on and it says, but if you live squinty-eyed in in, in greed and distrust... There's going to be a funky smell in your life, right? I don't know if you've ever have. we don't have too many basements in California, but there, you know, if you have a, ever been in a basement somewhere that doesn't have the right airflow, there's a, there's kind of an aroma there that sounds, you know, just not smelling too good. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Okay. And then the verse goes on. He talks about if you pull the blinds uh, 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 on your window, that dark life, uh, what a dark life you will have right? And, and I think that there's so much truth to that. Paul writes in Ephesians, and he, he uses a different analogy. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you would know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glory inheritance in the saints, right? In other words, you don't have eyes in your heart, but if you look at the world through the perspective of God, things begin to change, right? And so jot this down at the very top of your outline, because we're going to look at this over the week, and I wanted you to do it, so I didn't put it in the outline, and that is belief or beliefs determine your behavior. Beliefs determine your behavior, right? So if you believe something, it will manifest itself in your behavior. If you think, again, you're a loser, you think you're not capable, that's going to manifest it in life. If you think you can't have healthy relationships, It's going to manifest itself in life. If you think you're an overcomer, it's going to manifest itself in life. And it's basically going to be determined on how you see the world. If you see through the perspective of God, you're going to see it as I can. If you're going to see it through the eyes of yourself or the world, you're going to see it as I can't. All right? So in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, kind of the dean, they call him the dean of modern day psychology today, a guy named Charles Cooley, Dr. Charles Cooley, and he wrote a thesis about how people perceive himself, and I believe it was called like the seeing yourself through the glass uh, or through the cup, not the cup that cut myself, but a different, a different cup, and, and so his, his, her, his thesis was basically that all of us have a pyramid of relationships in our life. And, you know, as you start out wide at the base of the thing, it, it's, you know, fr- light friendships, you know, acquaintances, that kind of stuff. And then as you build up toward the point, it becomes the more important relationships. And the person at the very top or the few at the top, how they view you is how you determine yourself. Okay, and this was his thesis, and that's still in psychology. That still is kind of a thought that they carry on in in the, in psychology today. And so, is whoever is at the top of your pyramid is the person as, of how you determine your worth. So let's just play along. If it's a, a father or grandfather or ex spouse or a spouse that is constantly filleting you with horrible words, that's how you perceive yourself. That's how you view yourself, right? Now, we're in church, and so obviously who's supposed to be at the very top of that would be God is, right? And that's what God was doing to Moses. He was saying, listen, you're looking at the pyramid in a wrong way. I'm at the top. I'm the one who created you. I'm the one who gave you your mouth. I'm the one who will speak through you in life, right? And so he's trying to change his perspective in life, and obviously in Proverbs 23, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, right? Which again, it, it's a similar type of thing that Dr. Coley came up with in, in his thesis that, that he wrote about it. So your, your beliefs determine your behavior in life. Now, if it's wrong, it's still going to determine your behavior. If it's right, it's going to determine your behavior. So how do you self-correct that? And this is the part that's so important to begin to walk through. So let me give you 10 of the top uh, areas of changing our view of who we are, right? Remember when Carson used to do the top 10, right? You, you remember that? Back in the day, 100 years ago. This is true. I got just a couple minutes. So Tammy and I went, anybody go see Carson back in the day? 
Yeah? So we went, Tammy and I went, we were in LA, we're like, let's go get tickets to Carson. So Kenny Rogers was there actually too as well. And so this is honest, crazy thing. We're sitting in there, they got the clap, you know, the lights, the whole nine yards. We go into commercial break. Carson and, uh, was it Ed McMahon? Never said a single word to each other. Nothing. They didn't have cell phones back in the day, so they weren't checking their email. It was like, and then the producer would say, three, two, one, welcome back, everybody. <laughs> Ed would laugh. I'm like, so my thought was, this is free of charge. I don't know if they liked each other or not. It didn't appear like they liked each other too much. That was free. Thank you. All right. Good night, folks. All right. Number 10 in your outline. It's still, 40 years later, it still sits in my mind. Obviously, right? Yeah. So I still trip on it. It's like, man, I can't believe it. It was a great show, though. Now, number 10 in your outline. Who created you? And the answer is? Okay. For about four of you believe it, Moses. Do I have Moses in the house today? So who created you? God created you, right? And uh, Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship, right? And you can personalize it, for Dan is God's workmanship, right? Whatever your name is, place it in there. For you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, right? And, And the amazing thing is, is that you are unique, The whole idea that in heaven they're stamping and everybody's the same and everybody looks the same and all this other stuff. Folks, that is not how God has created us. God has created us uniquely and different. And when I compare myself to the world, I am going to have problems with myself. Right? I have to accept this is who God made me to be. I am unique. I am preciously made. I was formed in my mother's womb. And he doesn't make junk. Right? So we personalize it. Two is who chose you, and the answer is, or number nine, I guess I should say, uh, who chose you? God, right? We're not going to get into the theological thing on that, but in uh, 1 Thessalonians it says, for we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you. And again, this is, to me, absolutely amazing. I still trip on this in my study when I start praying, that God looked at my life, and listen, right, I had a lot of things to clean up. And he looked at me, and he rescued my wretched soul from the pits of hell. Right? That is crazy to me. Right? And he's done that for you, too. He's reached down by his grace and mercy, and he has said, I want you. Right? And he selected you to be on his team. I think that's cool. I still have a great time with that. And then uh, uh, number eight in your outline, who protects you? And the answer to that is... God protects you, right? Psalms, uh, Psalms one, uh, seven, or Psalm 17, verse 8. Keep and guard me uh, as a pupil of your eye. You're like, what does that mean? Have you heard the phrase, I got you, man? So this is God's way of saying, I got you, right? It means that he never turns his eye from you, okay? Now, the other week I had, I tell you, I have my little grandson, Elliot. He's going to be two. And he is a busybody, and we are in the garage. We have a swimming pool in the backyard. The door was kind of open, and I turned away to do something. And if, you have a, if you're a parent or a grandparent, you probably have had one of these moments where I turned away to do something, and I turned back around, and he wasn't there, right? You know that feeling that you get? It feels like a tidal wave of fear that is whoosh, right? And I'm like, Elliot right? Elliot, right? And he was on the other side of the car getting ready to get on the slide and stuff, and I didn't see him. He was safe, right? So his dad let me have him again for next week. And so, so but, but for that moment, it's like, yikes, right? And if you have kids or grandkids, you, you probably know, maybe, maybe you don't, you're like, they don't see me? Okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> That's a different problem. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. But, but all of a sudden, so that verse says, God's eye never leaves you. God never turns and goes, where's he at? Now, here's the flip side to that. Where are you taking him? You with me? Hello? All right. We on number six? Seven. Who made you complete? Your spouse did. No, of course not. God made you complete, right? And in 2 Peter, he says, uh, his divine power has given us everything we need Uh, for life and godliness, right? So the whole idea that your spouse makes you complete is absolutely not true. 
right? As great of a person as I am, and as haughty of a hot that I am, and as good looking as I am, and as smart as I am, and all that, are you all with me on, are you following along? I don't make my wife complete. You should say amen to that. <laughs> you should say, duh, Pastor Dan. And the truth is, right, Christ makes me complete, and oh, by the way, God has blessed me with a wonderful wife, right? So if you're single and you're in Christ, you're complete. If you're married in Christ, you're complete. Your spouse is not a part of, that, of the equation of that. Uh, number seven, are we on seven? Six, all right. Number six, I'm just making sure you can count because I failed kindergarten. Who made you victorious? And the answer is... God did, exactly, in Romans 8, 37, we'll see this next week, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, and I oftentimes say, folks, we fight from victory, not for victory. If you're a football fan, you already have the Lombardi trophy in your house, God just wants you to live as if you have it, all right? Are you following me, right? You won, the game's over. You won the Super Bowl. You won the whatever it is that you're into. You have the trophy. Now live it. And so your beliefs are going to indicate that. Are you all with me? Number uh, five in your outline, who called you? I, I don't know. I don't have caller ID. I'm not sure who it is. Number five in your outline, Second Timothy, it says, who has saved us and has called us to a holy life? Not because of anything that we have done, amen to that, but because of his own purpose and his own grace. So God has called you, and he's given you guidance and direction. He's given you everything that you need. Number four in your outline, again, another thing that amazes me is who has forgiven you, and the answer is God has forgiven you. And uh, Isaiah, in another wonderful verse, 34, or 30, 43, 25, says, I, even I... I am he who blots out your transgressions. Why does God forgive you? For my own sake. For God's sake, right? Which I always think is amazing. And remembers my sins how often? No more, right? So not when we're playing games and we give it, God, forgive me today for what I'm going to do tonight. That's a game you're playing with God. That doesn't count. You're just... God's going to end up getting you at some point. But when we are sincere about the sin that we've committed in our life and we confess it, the scripture says that God remembers it no more. Now, you may have not forgiven yourself, in which case you got the rotisserie thing going on, or the enemy wants to remind you of what you've done wrong. But God is not. All right? So you have to take a couple steps back and think about that. Uh, number three in your outline, who freed me? And the answer is God, right? And uh, in John 8, it says this, then you will know the truth. And what will the truth do? The truth will set you free. Side note, this is a confusing part in Western churches in, in, uh, in America, North America. And that is we believe knowledge brings freedom. It doesn't. Knowledge plus application brings freedom, all right? Knowledge alone does not bring freedom. It's the application of it. It's the beliefs that we have manifest itself in actions. So you've heard me say this. This isn't a giving message, but this is the, the thing that I oftentimes use. If you believe that God will meet all your needs in Christ Jesus, and you don't give because you feel like you don't have enough, you don't believe Matthew 6, 33. Because if you believed it, you would do it. Are you with me? Yes. Right? So if we know something and don't do it, we don't actually believe it. We just know it. All right? So when you know the truth and you are manifesting it in your life, you're app, uh, applying it into your life, you will be set free. Now, the thing is, is in the life of believers, there are, remember prison, the old days in the prison garb where they would have the striped outfits that you would see prisoners would wear? There are believers who have that attire on walking through. They're free in Jesus, but they live as if they're still a prisoner. We don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. Amen? Number two in your outline is who loves, uh, who loves you? And the answer is 
your mama does, all right? Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. You guys are my last crowd, so I'm going to be a little uh, 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 obnoxious with you guys. You okay with that? Yeah. All right, good. Because <laughs> if not, I'll be done in an hour. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with what kind of love? Yeah. Everlasting. Now, let's be honest. We mostly love conditionally. If you do, I love you. If you don't do, we got a problem. God does not love conditionally. There is nothing that you can do today that would make God love you more than he already loves you. That is an amazing thought to think about because he loves us unconditionally. Uh, Number one in your outline, the last one is, who has accepted you? And the answer to that is... God has in Romans 15, 7, it says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. And again, I always find this amazing. It's not because I had a perfect life and cleaned up my yard and didn't have any problems. The truth is, I was a mess. And God in his grace and his mercy reached down. And so when people say, well, as soon as I get my life together, then I'll find Christ or then I'll go to church or whatever. It's like, no, you come to Christ and then he cleans up your yard right? You don't clean up your own yard, all right? So uh, for those of you who've been around for a little while, I read and wrote uh, an I am statement. I think they're still in the lobby area on the way out. There's a few from it. And and I'm just going to read a paragraph just to give you an idea of what 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 I wrote. It says, I am strong and mighty in the Lord, and then I have passages of Scripture. I have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells within me. I am, uh, I am a weapon of righteousness in a dark world. I am not my past. I'm not what I did. I'm not who people think I am. I am who Christ says that I am, right? And I have a, I have a whole, whole pa- uh, page of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six pa- uh, paragraphs of that. Here's your challenge. Take the 10, and you already have the scripture in it. Take the 10, and you write who you are in the eyes of Christ. Because Moses missed it. Moses talked about, I I stutter, and I get my brother, find somebody else, I can't do it, right? Go back to the pyramid. God should be at the top. And what does he think of you? He has created you, he has chosen you, he protects you, he's completed you, he gives you victory, he's called you, he's forgiven you, he's freed you, he's loved you, and he has accepted you. Take a deep breath. Now live that way, right? (laughs) Believe it. Believe it. And when we believe it, we will ultimately live it in our life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather today. And Lord, I pray that as we leave here today, we won't just know it, that we'll actually apply it into our life. And Lord, that your spirit will radically change us, will begin to chip away and remove the wounds that we have in our life. Lord, we know that only Jesus makes us whole and heals us. And Father, I pray and I present the folks who are here today and the services today and those who are online, Lord, I present them before you. And I ask, Lord, that your word would speak into their lives and begin to heal them in every single way. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ. And I want to close with that opportunity. And we do a little ABC and there's no formula, but it's just a way we track it. But A is admit that we're sinners, that we all have made mistakes. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross and that he rose again. And C is to confess him or to commit your life to him as Lord and Savior. And so if you've never done that, as I, as I say this prayer, just repeat silently these words. Just say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I am a sinner, that I have messed up. And Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, that you died on a cross and that you rose again. And today, I confess you to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said...
Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer with me, there's some cards around you. You can fill it out and drop it in the box. If you're online, you can text the number on the screen. And there's also some green bags in the back of the auditorium if you'd like to, to grow in your spiritual life, all right? So there's prayer in room 201 if you're interested in having prayer. 201 is kind of across from the area where the coffee's at. And then the last thing is if you see Jordan in the lobby, make sure that you welcome him. So God bless you guys. We'll see you on the way out. What an incredible experience. Remember, we go live every weekend, so be sure to hit subscribe on our channel so you can be notified whenever we upload new content. I also want to invite you to join us for an in-person service when you get a chance. Joining us for one of our in-person services is a great way to meet and interact with new people in our Laurel Ridge family. You can find out more about Laurel Ridge and activities for your whole family by visiting our website. And we can't wait to see you next time. Until then, have a great week, and remember, God loves you.